If I'm reviewing a book on my channel, you know I probably liked it. Hello and welcome back to Bookish and welcome to my review of Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. Uh, Trespasses is one of the books uh, nominated for the Women's Prize this year and I believe the shortlist comes out either the day you're going to see this video or the day after. This is so far the only uh, book on the Women's Prize uh, long list that I've read. I am starting Fire Rush today, but you probably know from my channel I'm not a huge awards list reader. I do oftentimes find uh, books uh, on the list that I like and I read rarely do the books that uh, I like the best end up winning. <clears throat> so I was lucky enough to get uh, my copy of Trespasses uh, from Kim over at Middle of the Bookmark. Uh, she buddy read the book with Britta Bowler uh, and she didn't like it and she offered to give it to somebody and I volunteered and she gave it to me and I'm really glad that she did because I really liked it. I really thought uh, it was a good book. So I'm going to try to talk about the things about the book that I thought were good and try not to give uh, too many spoilers. Uh, so here we go. So Trespasses is set in Northern Ireland in 1975, kind of right at the right in the middle of the Troubles, that period of sectarian violence uh, between Catholics and Protestants uh, that took place in Northern Ireland over a long period of time and really didn't effectively, for the most part, come to an end until the 1990s. Uh, the main character of the novel is a young woman in her 20s, I believe she's 24, named Kushla. Uh, and Kushla uh, is a Catholic young woman. Uh, she uh, lives with her mother, Gina, uh, because her father has died. Her mother, Gina, is an alcoholic. She works at a Catholic uh, primary school in the small town uh, outside of Belfast in which she lives uh, and she also works helps out her brother uh, at the pub that her brother essentially inherited from her father in this small town. Now this small town in which they live uh, is you know like all places in Northern Ireland uh, there is tension between Catholics and Protestants but for the most part the troubles had seemed to have kind of bypassed this small town until relatively recently. But there are places where this where we see this tension uh, early on in the book. One of those places is the pub uh, that uh, Kusha's brother Eamon uh, owns and runs. He is Catholic. The bar is owned. The pub is owned by Catholics, but most of the patrons uh, that come to the pub are in fact Protestant, including a fair number of soldiers, uh, English soldiers who come uh, to the bar to drink, as well as a leader of one of the local uh, Protestant paramilitary groups is also a regular uh, in the bar. Uh, the school uh, at which uh, Kushla teaches is a Catholic school uh, that is run by an administration uh, including a priest who is uh, an absolute nightmare and about whom all kind of implications are made as well as an administration uh, which is prejudiced in its views uh, towards Protestants uh, and which uh, a young student there uh, named Davy McGowan whose mother is Protestant and whose father is Catholic is, uh, is subjugated to, you know, being excluded from things. Anyway, there, these tensions are there uh, at the very beginning in almost every institution in which Kushla has to interact. Uh, one day, uh, she's at the bar uh, and she meets an older man, a man who she knows uh, from her mother, was uh, friendly with her mother and who is friends with her father. His name is Michael. He is a Protestant uh, attorney uh, who represents people on both sides, but oftentimes represents Catholics who have been accused of crimes, uh, oftentimes violent crimes. And he comes in the bar and she meets him and she uh, is attracted to him and she begins an affair with him. Michael is a married man. I mentioned to you that he uh, is a barrister. He's an attorney. Uh, he's had many affairs before. He definitely seems to me to have a drinking problem, uh, not quite as severe as Kushla's mother, uh, Gina, but has a drinking problem, and Kushla finds him attractive. One of the things I think that is key to understanding the book, and I'll talk about this more in a little bit, is why perhaps Kushla finds this older man, who is, you know, physically attractive, but, you know, who is a Protestant where she's a Catholic, why she finds him to be uh, attractive. In addition to Michael, uh, Kushla has attracted the perhaps romantic attention of one of her work colleagues, 
uh, the person who teaches the other kind of essentially third grade classroom at your school whose name is Jerry and they become friends and they go out on dates and he plays a really important role. Her brother Eamon uh, is doing his best to earn a living to support his family by running this pub and to prevent sectarian tensions between Protestants and Catholics from affecting his business and putting his business in danger. Important to keep in mind when understanding Eamon, who I think it's easy to misunderstand as a character. You know, we are talking about a time of the Troubles where bars, restaurants, hotels uh, are being blown up. Uh, you know, particularly bars, restaurants, hotels that uh, where Protestants uh, go. And I mentioned to you that Eamon's bar is where Protestants and soldiers go, uh, go to drink. Um, and then there's also these characters who we were introduced to through that young uh, student in Kushla's class named David McGowan. Uh, I mentioned that his mother is Protestant, his father is Catholic. They live in kind of Catholic housing projects uh, because, you know, Catholics in Northern Ireland are the oppressed minority, uh, I suppose, and oftentimes more likely live in poverty. But even in that community, they're not accepted because of the mixed relationship or mixed family in which they live. So this is kind of the setup for this story. And one of the things I think that, that it's, that it's kind of, that slowly develops in the story, but it develops in a really important way, is how the troubles, this sectarian violence between uh, Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, how the troubles affect Kushla and everything else that happens in the book. In the beginning, they just seem like a backdrop. We don't see a lot. You know, I what I told you about, you know, the Catholics and Protestants and and and, and how that affects Kushla's, Kushla's life, you know, that's there and that's introduced, but it doesn't seem to be playing a large role. And really, you go through, you know, the first hundred pages or so, and it, it, it seems like something that's kind of uh, makes situations occasionally awkward for Kushla with her relationship with Michael, but doesn't seem to be playing a bigger role. But that menace is always there. And as the story goes on, the troubles uh, intrude more and more on Kushla's relationship with Michael until we, when you, by, the end, by the time you get to the end, it's the troubles and that sectarian violence which really dominate the book. And I think that is really, really skillfully handled because what it do, did for me as a reader is it allowed me to get immersed in the story and the characters and things like that. And yes, you know, all the trouble stuff was back there in the background, uh, but you know, much like perhaps Kushla experienced during her relationship, she was able to ignore it for a while, and then you're not. And once you're not able to ignore it, it plays a bigger and bigger role, and ultimately a really profound role in the outcome of the story. And I think that is incredibly well handled. I think that slow building of tension, that slow building of menace, that feeling that you know Kushla's happiness is going to be uh, destroyed by something, uh, and then the awareness that perhaps that something's going to be the troubles, build slowly, and I actually think that was handled really well. As, as I alluded to in the beginning, I think the, the main question is, why is Kushla attracted uh, to Michael? Why does she enter into this affair with this married man who has a reputation for uh, philandering, for chasing women, uh, who is a Protestant, who is older than she is, uh, who, you know, is definitely careworn, and he has some mileage on him, and he does like to drink. Why does Kushla find this man attractive? Is it because she's just seeking attention? I mean, Kushla's life seems really confined. She has to watch herself at work because she doesn't want to lose a job. She lives at home with her mother, who's an alcoholic, and it's her primary responsibility since her dad died to take care of her mother. She has to help her brother by working in the pub, and there, you know, she has to kind of do what he says. You know, this idea that maybe she uh, it needs attention, I think, might be something. But the truth of the matter is, even though we don't get a really full description of Kushla at any point in the book, you kind of have to pick it up as you go along, uh, we do learn that she's attractive. She uh, receives plenty of attention from men, men at the bar, soldiers at the bar, uh, Jerry at her school. You know, it's not like she does not receive attention from men. So I don't think that's it. Uh, what I think attracts her to Michael is the fact that Michael seems to be unaffected by that separation between Catholics and Protestants, that he is willing to even though he's a Protestant, even though he's well-to-do, even though he's educated, he is willing to defend Catholics. 
He's willing to defend uh, Kushla. He's willing to take on the Protestant uh, hierarchy. And he doesn't seem to live his life as though he's affected by it, at least not at first. And every other man in Kushla's life is in some ways, and I don't mean this to be meanly about them, this is the reality they lived in, they had to adapt to it, and there are reasons why they did, but in some ways, every Catholic man that she knows is made somewhat impotent, I don't mean sexually, but made, but made somewhat impotent, by the fact that they constantly have to deal with the fact that there is this Protestant uh, majority that controls the police and the military, which can emasculate them. Uh, and Michael doesn't seem to be uh, affected by that. So I thought I'd just read you uh, two scenes uh, from the book that are really early that I think really make this point and at least explain why Kushla is initially attracted to Michael. Because, you know, I think, you know, once you get to know somebody, uh, you're more likely to find them more and more attractive. And, and you know, so that's part of it. But I, but I think the real question is why does Kushla... Why is Kushla initially attracted to him? So I'm just going to read two short scenes for you uh, from the book. Uh, the first is in which uh, Kushla is working at, at the pub. Uh, literally, this is like page nine. She's working at the pub. Uh, there are soldiers there, and one of them gropes her. Michael's in the pub at the same time. This is when she first meets him. So here we go. When she could bear to raise her head, the man gave her a smile. His eyes were kind. He had heard everything, and she was ashamed, more for Eamon than, her, than herself, and set about tidying the shelves of bottled beer. Nice view, an English voice said. Uh, she glanced in the mirror. The groper was standing at the counter, a banknote in his hand. Uh, behind her, the beer tap gasped as Eamon pulled pints for him. She's pretending she can't hear me, the groper said. Perhaps because you're humiliating her, said Michael. Kusha felt herself turn. He had swiveled on his stool and was facing the soldier, the whiskey resting on his left palm. Come on, mate, I'm having a laugh, the soldier said, so shrilly he sounded like a whining child. Humor is most effective when it's mutual, Michael said. The groper leaned forward, paused, then drew his neck back in, as if he thought better of it. He picked up the three glasses awkwardly and went back to the table, beer dribbling across the floor. Eamon was staring implacably at the television, but she knew by the set of his chin he felt emasculated. Fidel and the others, uh, too, looked as if nothing had happened. Who was this man? Well, that man is Michael. And you'll notice that here in the bar where Kushla has been groped and is being sexualized by a soldier, a Protestant soldier in a way that makes her very uncomfortable, Michael is the one who intervenes. Michael is the one who appears to not be afraid. Michael is the one who appears, even though he's Protestant, to be willing to take on the forces, uh, in this case represented by a soldier, who has emasculated Amon and who is sexualizing her. Con contrast that with a scene that takes place uh, in, around page, or on page 34 in which uh, Kushla is out on a date with Jerry, Jerry, her work colleague, who's asked her out. Uh, and they're going to a party. And on the way to the party, they have to go through a, a checkpoint. Uh, a checkpoint controlled by the Protestant police or military forces um, and they get stopped. And this is the scene then that plays out. You've got the war paint on, sweetheart, he said, his face fully in the car. This is a soldier she's talking about. His complexion was cratered with acne scars and his mouth smelled of juicy fruit. Her hem had ridden halfway up her thighs. She pulled it down over her knees, but the fabric snapped back up when she let it go. Did you hear me? I said you've got the war paint on. We're on our way to a party. Is your boyfriend on a promise? No. A few feet away, Jerry was facing a brick wall his hands behind his ears, the scene lit by a street lamp and the week of his hazard lights. To his right and left, premises on the, on the row were closed and caged by metal, apart from a chip shop a few doors up, the writs in large red letters on its cracked sign. A length of, of loose guttering was drooling thick, rusty liquid onto his forehead. He had lifted a hand to wipe it away, and the soldier tapped his elbow with the butt of his gun. You're teasing him then? No. You're a prick tease. She remembered a recruitment advertisement she had seen in the magazine. If, if you've got it in you, the army will bring it out. On the footpath, the first soldier nudged Jerry with the butt of his gun again, and Kushla opened her mouth to object, but Jerry was walking towards the car, his gait jerky, mechanical, blinking rapidly. He sat in the driver's seat, wiping his forehead with the back of his hand. Kushla took a tissue from her handbag and passed it to him. He blotted his face, hand trembling, and drove off slowly. So, notice in that scene that the soldiers... Uh, really humiliate Jerry, and they say inappropriate things to uh, Kushla. 
but Jerry can't do anything about it. Well, this isn't Jerry's fault, but it does kind of, I think, show the contrast between the two potential love interests that Kushla has in the novel, between Michael, who is willing to take the risk of standing up to him and does so effectively to protect Kushla, and Jerry, who quite literally can't. I think that's the reason for the initial attraction. Now, as the story goes on, Kushla herself questions why she's with Michael. You know, she realizes that uh, he is not her first affair. Some of the things he says and does are, I think, creepy and unattractive. And she kind of questions these things herself. So why does she continue to be attracted to him? And I think that's a legitimate question. But I, my answer would be that oftentimes people end up attracted to people for reasons that don't seem to make sense and aren't very logical. Uh, and, you know, we question this relationship right along with Kusha the whole time. And again, I think that's one of the things that's brilliant about the book. The last thing I'll mention I think is really brilliant about the book is the title, Trespasses. You know, I read a lot of books. And oftentimes, by the time I get to page 20 of the book, I'm not even thinking about what the title is. But in this case, that title, Trespasses, is incredibly important. And if you read the book, I want you to think of all the times in which someone trespasses in a place they're not supposed to be and the implications of that. Just to give you three really quick, real quick ones that are more obvious. There's a scene in which the police literally break into a Catholic wedding with guns armed and kind of search around. That's one trespass. Uh, Kushla attends parties with Michael at the homes of other Protestants and that clearly feels like trespassing. Uh, Kushla gets involved with Davy's family, the McGowan family, actually goes to their home and that begins to feel like trespassing. Think of all the times in which trespassing takes place. The soldiers and the helicopters out, you know, hovering over the city. The soldiers in Amon's bar. Um, the, all these scenes that take place. And if you think about those things, that, that title trespasses, and you think about how the number of trespasses build over the course of the story, I think you see the real power of the story and how what appears to be a story about a relatively banal and, and stereotypical love affair between a young woman and an older man is really a story about how intrusive this atmosphere of violence and that division really is. And I think that's where the power of the novel really lies. Anyway, there's my review of Trespasses. I really liked it. Uh, if you've read it, let me know what you think in the um, comment section down below. And as always, thank you for watching.